Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live event. We are working on a fun little project that allows us to make something useful, uh, do a bit of quilting, have some fun with color, and maybe if you'd like to work with a little bit of bias binding, here is a good project. Um, this is what I originally called the chicken mitten. And it basically is a pot holder. But in my family, my kids were always chicken to put their hands into the oven with a regular pot holder. So in light of the chickens come from eggs and my kids were afraid to put their hand in there for they were so afraid of burning the fingers that this is the chicken mitten. It protects all of your fingers from hot surfaces, allows you to move things from A to B in the kitchen, but has a little fun the flavor of the Easter kind of spring season going on. So if you have collected some of those fun prints, those springy looking things out there, and I know in the Midwest, we're maybe getting snow this weekend. I'm still thinking spring. So let's work on the chicken mitten today. Our pattern, of course, will be available in the chat. And I'm sure there goes the QR code so you can just use your phone, go across it with your camera, and it will take you a link right to the page to download the pattern. If you um, haven't had time to download, you can always do it after the show also. Remember, all of our patterns are archived and videos are archived forever. You can always find us um, on the different uh, platforms out there. So the chicken mitten. Oh, and by the way, remember, let us know where you're watching from in the, the uh, comment or chat section below. We love to hear where you're watching from. I think the last video I did, I might have counted six or seven different countries. That's wonderful. We are we really enjoy bringing our community of quilters and crafters together. So let us know where you're watching from. We love to give everyone a heads up if we have time. And we have Kelly from Arizona. Good morning, Kelly. Um, Melinda says good morning from. Hmm. Oh, new to the channel. We are welcome. Welcome you to um, our our wonderful live events in the quilt community. And Judy is watching from the UK. Hi, Judy. You've been watching for a long, long time. We appreciate you um, out there. Donna says good morning from Northern Illinois. Another Midwesterner. Yay. Okay. So the the um, pattern they're going to download. Yours is going to look a little different. It's going to have branding on it from our um, our platform but it will give you all of the materials needed. So it's basically fat quarters, okay? You need um, enough or maybe even, I think you can maybe get by, mm, you can maybe get by on a quarter yard, I believe because of the width of this project. Should give you, yep, it's less than nine inches. So a quarter yard would work, but a lot of us buy fat quarters when we're out shop popping. So that would be the thing to look for. So something for the outside, something for the inside. I kind of like to have a contrast so that looks like there's a stripe across the egg. And then I like to have something else for the outer edge. And a fat quarter is enough fabric for you to get that bias binding cut off of. A quarter yard is going to be a little tight. You might have to actually link pieces together across to get bias binding that way. So that's why I kind of lean towards the fat quarter, the 18 by 22 inch piece of fabric that are pre-cuts in most um, of your local quilt shops. Then you're going to need some batting and a um, another product. So here, regular cotton batting or cotton poly that you use for, um, cotton's probably the best because it's the most heat um, safe or uh, heat happy fiber. Polyester tends to melt. So we want to stay away from that really heavy polyester kind of batting. So 100% cotton is probably your best or an, at least an 80-20 blend. And you can use up those scraps. You only need pieces, you know, big enough to um, we're actually layer between your fat quarters. That's the easiest way to go about it because of the process we're going to do. The other thing that you may want to use, because I like to use a layer of the cotton batting and a layer of what we call insulbrite. Now, if I put this by my mic, I think you can hear the crinkly sound as it has a metallic layer in it that helps to reflect heat. And I have a package of it here. So insulbrite, this is what it looks like. It's from the warm company. If you're making a lot of hot pads, if you're going to make, um, maybe you're going to make one for everybody in, who's coming to Easter dinner. Um, this would be a great way to just use up the package while you're at it. So Insel Bright is available at quilt shops. It's available online, or you can use two to three layers of the cotton batting. That's your choice. 
Um, I've done in both ways and they both work. They're both in my kitchen drawer and I use them all the time. So however you decide to do that, either by layering up two or three layers of cotton battings or doing a layer of a cotton batting along with the Insulbrite gives you that extra protection for your hands. So we're gonna use those kinds of battings. Then maybe some template plastic. You're gonna get a template like this in your pattern. It has the shapes and it, there's one that has the background um, shape also. I guess I put it off to the side there. So the continuous egg so that you have the background or the back backside and then the top and bottom. So you'll have those three templates. And sometimes when we're making multiples of things, you know, a paper template's okay to draw around. You can transfer it to cardstock or a, um, this is because my husband's a comic book collector. We have comic book boards at our house. Plastic. If you decide, well, maybe I want to go back and make these again. Sometimes it's nice to have them made up in template plastic. So it's easy to trace around them. That edge is very sturdy. And I trace these on onto template plastic with pencil first. And then I go back with a Sharpie and give myself a nice defined edge and label them. So I remember what are those shapes for? So these will tell you the egg top and bottom and, and the body of the egg. So, and also transfer over those little markings that line up the opening section. The other thing is that you're going to be pretty much lining up the top edge and the bottom edge with your templates. So those um, areas will be very um, logical when it comes to once these are bound edges that that's going to be where um, the opening is going to be at. So if you'd like to transfer those to plastic or to cardboard, do so. It will help you out in the long run of doing the tracing portion of this. Okay, so let's get started. Let's see who else we've got. We've got Cookie from Lovettsville, Virginia. Cold and windy. It's a, It was cold and windy here yesterday too. We're going to go for 60 today and maybe snow like four inches this weekend or Monday. Wonderful. I love spring in the Midwest. Judy says, greetings from sunny Saskatchewan. Um, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Canada. Marion says, uh, hello from Wisconsin. Susan says, good morning from Kansas. And Shirley says, good morning, watching from Ontario, Canada. So we've got our Canadian watchers out there in force. Wonderful. We are so glad that you're here because it's fun to share projects with quilters. I think that's why quilters love to go to retreats and classes because they love to share ideas I, I sometimes wonder what actually gets done at retreats other than the community building and the sharing of ideas. We, we work on projects a little along the way. Um, Peggy says, hello from Victorville, California. Or no, not Victorville. V Vic hmm, Vacaville? I don't know for sure, <laughs> unless that was a typo. And Jean says, hello from North uh, Dakota. Helen from California, Kathleen from Northern California. We got the Californians awake this morning. Wonderful. Okay. The next thing we need to do is take our fabrics. Once we've got our templates traced, you might want to actually keep a copy of the original and then trace for cutting out. Just it's sometimes nice to keep the originals all with the patterns so that when you go back, if you happen to misplace things and you can, you still have that template available. Okay. In order to get started, it's time to layer up your batting and your backing and your fabrics. Now you can layer them and pin the layers together if that is your preference. You can use a spray base if that's your preference. Um, my favorite is the, I don't have it listed there, I'm sorry, but the KK2000 made by Sulky. This little bottle goes a long, long way. And so just a little bit of tackiness does help keep the layers together. Um, you're going to then put your backing fabric, which is the inside of your chicken mitten, and your um, print fabric. So print on top, facing up, your two battings. It doesn't really matter which layer of batting comes first. This just happens to be how I've layered them, mine. So the outer fabric, the cotton batting, the insole bright, and then the interior fabric, just, um, just as a reference. So once those are layered up, I've already cut away a small piece of this, but what you're going to be doing is taking your templates and you're actually going to trace these. Let's see, this happens to be the egg top there. I already had the bottom traced and cut out and the egg top, but what you do is trace around these shapes. Now I know this is a little bit different kind of construction than you normally may do. You might 
cut out everything first and then layer them together. But I had a little trick that I thought was helpful. So I'm trying to share that with you is to layer everything. So your fat quarter, fabric, batting, batting, backing fabric, trace on there your shapes. And you can see that I've traced that with a marker, the blue line, light blue line on there. And then we're going to take it to the sewing machine and we're going to stitch one eighth of an inch just inside of that marked line. And at this point, usually because these are fairly small, you don't need to worry about using a walking foot. Um, I got by not using a walking foot. If you love your walking foot, go ahead and use it. But if you aren't familiar with a walking foot or don't have one, or maybe you just don't like yours very well, <laughs> maybe you don't do a lot of machine quilting um, on your domestic machine, you can get by doing the stitching on this without um, changing over to a walking foot. So one eighth inch in towards the interior of the shape, one eighth of an inch in from that marked line. And if I hold it up, I think my black thread will show up that it's just inside the blue marked line that I traced for the shape. This holds all of the shape, the fabric layers together. Now take your scissors and cut on that marked line. So now you have everything sandwiched, the outside edge is all nice and secure and you can work with your individual shapes. And let's see, I have pieces over here. And now you can go back and quilt them. There's really no reason to quilt the whole fat quarter because you're going to trim away a bunch of pieces and you're going to waste all that. So I thought it was a lot easier just to quilt the individual shape. And then you don't need that walking foot now so that you can see there we go. Jean says a great idea for placemats too. Yes. Um, doing the, those kinds of um, battings and even insole bright is really good heat resistant. If you're worried about your table, if you have a really nice dining room table and you don't want heat to be transferred to that because that leaves those wonderful white marks on our dining room tables. And I know because I think I have a few of them when mistakes were done by kids <laughs> or even by me, by bad choices, um, it will protect your wooden surface. So that reflects the heat back up and won't um, put the heat into the table itself. So you can use it there too. Um, Donna says, hello from Rockport, Texas. We're glad you're here. So once you have that traced and then cut out, and then you can go in and do your simple quilting. I did put quilting lines in with a um, fabric happy marker so that I could um, easily do a cross hatch on this one. Um, on the original, which is the one with the yellow and the picture on the cover, it's again cross hatched. Like I said, he, he's MIA right now. Um, on this one, I decided to have a little fun and I just did wavy lines, no marking literally just put it in the machine and drove kind of a lazy line. And then I went back and I set my foot so that I knew exactly how far away. It's not, not done with a double needle. I just did an, a double line wavy to do the quilting on this one. And it was really fun and doesn't have to be super precise because it's a chicken mitten. Okay. So you can go then in and do all of the shapes, the backing fab, the backing side, and the top and the bottom of the egg and get them all quilted up nice and neat like this. And let's see, I have this one in progress and this one's also quilted. So my top and bottom of my sample are ready to go. If you do have any questions, always remember, put it in the comments, slow me down. So that Denise says it, hi from Victorville, California, the high desert. Yes, I even know where that's at on the map because I have a friend who uh, lives really close to that. Deb says, good morning from East Central Iowa. Yay for Iowa. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be fun watching all those Iowa teams in the NCAA tournament. Um, Patricia, Patricia says, good morning from Virginia. I'm a new member and I'm look, looking forward to learning more about um, quilting. Wonderful. This is a great place to find it because we have videos on so many techniques. If you are wanting to learn how to make half square triangles. If you want to learn how to make flying geese, if you want to learn how to do bias binding, 
uh, we've got a video for it. So just remember to go back and search um, through our websites and you will find all kinds of great information. Okay, so once you have all of your pieces cut out, let's take this guy away. We don't need our templates anymore. We are going to work on bias binding because bias is used whenever there's a curve so that the fibers will relax and follow those gentle curves nicely. And it's probably the only time I use bias binding. I know traditionally quilts had bias binding because of longevity of that outer edge with a, a crossed fiber on the outer edge being extra strong. But on my normal quilts, I use straight of grain binding, but here, you have to use bias binding in order for this to roll to the back side nice and smooth and allow a nice gentle curve. So this is where bias binding comes into the, yeah, I got to use it. So I have one of mine already applied. So let's work on applying the second piece here. Now, if you've never cut bias binding before, um, we do have a video for that. And I bet if I give Max a head up, heads up in the background here that we can find a link maybe to the bias binding video. But bias binding means that the fibers are making an X through the binding so that it has the ability to move and has more stretch. And we've talked about bias binding in the, um, in the past on other projects that were round or shaped on the outer edge. But in order to cut bias binding really quick, what it means is that now this is a piece of fabric that has a fold here right in front of me. The selvage edge is up away from me. Normally straight of grain or cross grain, we cut binding this direction or possibly lengthwise um, parallel to the selvage edge. But in this case, we would take the fabric and I would just take it down to one layer at a time when I'm cutting bias binding just so that you know how if you make a miscut on double layer fabric, you make a double mistake. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So, um, And we don't need that much of it to get around the chicken mitten and to do the interior. So a 45 degree angle, go back to those days in geometry, 45 degree angle is what we need. And cut the width of, mm, I'm trying to think. I think we cut two and a half inch binding. Yes. You could do two and a quarter if you prefer. Everybody kind of has a different standard that they use. Neither one of them is any different than the other. They both work. So if you are used to using two and a quarter, that's fine. Two and a half just gives you a little bit more to get around the edge. But if you wanted to cut two layers at once, what I would do is take my fabric, know that fairly straight here, or perpendicular, to make a right angle um, salvage to the uh, cut edge. And, you know, if it's off by a half a degree, it's not that big a deal. But I would take this to the iron. I would press this. So now I have a nice 45 degree angle. And I would cut my two and a half inch widths off of here, joining them end to end, just like you do regular binding, so that you can create the binding that will go around um, your chicken knit. So I have some pieces already cut. And you're going to take that binding. This is just a sample one. Remember, you're going to fold it in half, wrong sides together to prepare it to go around your project. Now, back to our chicken mitten in progress. I found this little fabric with carrots on it. And it doesn't scream Easter, but it just says springtime. So I thought it was so much fun. Okay, we have to put binding along this edge. And in order to do that, most people kind of, it strikes a little fear in their heart at first because um, how to make bias binding. Yep, that's the, that's the video, Max. So if you can find that for people, if they want to learn more about bias binding uh, in a little bit more detail. But we are going to add that bias binding to this edge. And normally when we put binding down, it lays flat against the fabric and it just gently, we just gently put it together. But in this case, we're going to create what kind of looks like a bumpy kind of wiggly mess at first. And that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to look. So let's take this over to the machine. I'm going to set this for my quarter inch seam allowance. And I'm going to use the quarter inch, uh, put uh, run it so that the quarter inch is right against 
uh, one quarter inch from the cut edge of my project. And at the very beginning, we're going to, I'm going to extend it just a little bit so that I have a little extra there and then I can trim it afterwards. And as I begin, now that beginning portion is going to get caught in another seam. So you don't need to worry about back, um, back spacing or any back stitching or anything. But as I go along the cut edge of my quilted piece and my binding, have to stay together, but I'm going to have to kind of pull back on it a little bit. And it's going to be kind of bubbled up along the edge here, this folded edge, because I need to get enough fabric into that curve for it to roll. I don't want to pull it tight because I'm doing an exterior curve and a bump out. So it's going to be a little messy along the outer edge. And once I get this out, I'll show you what I mean by extra fabric there. I'm constantly adjusting to get my cut edges to stay right along each other. I want them married up perfectly. Now, as I get down into that lower edge, that's an interior curve, I can do a little tug on that. So extra fabric in the, F, the um, uh, all of a sudden I lost my, my words, uh, on the exterior curve, a little less fabric on the interior curve. Okay, we have a little bit of a straightaway as we get into it. Now I'm gonna tug on it just slightly as I work my way around that interior curve, and you don't want to go fast. This is just, you know, it's a little at a time as you get around the curve. Get used to doing that. Always stop with your needle in the down position. That allows you to adjust the fabrics and not um, have a jump in your stitching. So needle down when you stop. Now I'm kind of scrunching up. I'm getting extra fabric into that curve so it will roll nicely. And it almost looks gathery. It's roughly looking on that folded edge. And I know in our in our minds we're thinking that looks that looks hard. That looks like a mess. It's just getting used to the allowing some extra fabric in there. So <laughs> this is what I've got right now. See how that stands up? There's extra fabric here, and I pulled it a little snug down in here. Now when I roll it to the back side, everything's going to kind of release into place. So I'm going to take this over to the iron. If you wanted to really um, find its new memory, the thing you can do is just a little bit of a mist. And this is a misting bottle that just lets out a little tiny bit of moisture at once, not a big dump of water. And... Let's see. I want to make sure that I open this up to all the way to the stitching line. So with my iron, I don't want to damage anything underneath. Here we go. With my nose of my iron, I'm just kind of nudging the fabric out and away towards the seam line. So I get that opened up all the way. So I pressed along the stitching line inside there. Now I'm going to roll it to the back side. And the here's where the magic happens. Look how nice that rolls to the back side. And I get this really nice curved finished edge. Okay, so now on the back side, I'm going to give it just a little bit more moisture just so that it can kind of relax the fibers. And as I press this, it will find its spot along the back so that I can go back then and I can stitch by hand if I prefer, just like you would do the binding on the back of a quilt. Okay, so now we have rolled to the back. And yes, it's a little extra wide. That's because if you're going to mach machine stitch, you can catch that fold easily. If you're hand finishing, same as with, with a quilt, just do your little stitches along the fold there to secure the fabric. If you want to machine stitch, this is where, and you're in a hurry and you want to get done. This is what I found worked really nice. You can put this under the machine, put your needle in the center position so you can really see where the quilted piece and the binding come together. That's called a ditch. And you can stitch in the ditch and kind of hide your stitches. Now, I'm going to stitch with red, so you're going to see my stitching no matter what. But if I were doing this as a finished project, I would use a white probably because my Quilted portion is mostly white. You could top stitch in the orange with a matching orange thread if you like. It's just your choice how you want to stitch this to secure it. But 
Here we go. I'm going to stitch in the ditch all the way along to secure the edge of the binding. And I'll slow down so it makes it look a little better there. Try to stay as close to the ditch as possible. Used to be the term going in the ditch was a bad thing, but in, in quilting, it's kind of like, where can I hide my thread? Okay. Dorothy says, what is the pattern of the pink quilt behind you? Um, that quilt actually doesn't have a pattern currently. It's just something I made up. So I guess maybe I should write a pattern for it if you all vote for that. <laughs> Michelle says, hello from Texas. We don't actually say howdy. That is great. Uh, you know, that probably became something that uh, the movie makers probably came up with. Yeah. Um, so Jeannie says hello from Galveston, Tennessee. Cute project. Thanks. Um, here we go. So now stitch in the ditch. I didn't do a perfect job because I, that's what happens when you try to do things live. But um, stitch in the ditch there secures the, the fabric as it folds to the back. On this one, I think I cut mine two and a half. Two and a quarter actually works a little bit better so that when you do that stitch in the ditch, if I can turn this one really quick, it looks a little neater on the back. There you go. So that you can see the stitch in the ditch holds it in. You can also do hand stitching if you prefer that finishing. Um, if getting that turned to the back is fighting you, you can always use a little bit of a glue stick, either fabric glue stick. You could use just a conventional um, a glue stick that, Kids use at school. Um, I think I have, yep, I have one here. This kid's glue stick. It's all washable. Um, it can hold that down temporarily on the back as you're doing your stitching um, from the front to hold it in place. Then do the same thing on the second piece. So we just need to turn this one, stitch in the ditch here also. And I'm just going to do a quick press on this one so that we can layer up the pieces. You could even do a decorative stitch along there if you really like. Some people love to use all those fun stitches that our machines do and none of us tend to use very much. So you could even do a decorative stitch along there to hold it down if you'd like. There's so many ways to finish off. Um, let's see. We have Christy saying hello from Forest Lake, Minnesota. And Wendy says good morning from Central Pennsylvania. What thickness of, of a template did you use? When it comes to making templates, I use tend to use um, cardboard, like poster board kind of construction uh, or cardstock fab, uh, paper, or I get temple plastic at my local quilt shop. So those are, you know, there's a lot of choices out there for making your templates out of something that you can easily trace around. It's kind of nice to have something substantial other than paper if you're going to make more than one or two of them. Because, you know, inevitably you go to trace and your paper gets folded over, gets crinkled. It just seems like it doesn't stay very accurate. So the template plastic is kind of my go-to um, for creating templates that I'm going to use multiple times. Okay, so once you have your two pieces finished off, then it's just trimming that piece of bias or that little bias trim, even with the outer edge so that you can place the layers together. And even though this one's not stitched yet, we'll just do the placement. Okay, so now I want the green on the inside of this guy because I want the fun carrot print to be the outer edge or outer surface. So I'm going to go ahead and place. Now I told you about marking there. You know, if you were gonna pat, actually be matching up top and bottom edges fairly close, this is going to be accurate enough for you to get your hands into, you know, a, an eighth of an inch one way or the other on a chicken mitten isn't going to make any difference. <laughs> okay. So once you have those layers put together, you can use either pins, you can use um, wonder clips. If you're using those, if you like those little tiny, um, they look like little close pins to clip the edges together. So you can go and baste around this with a machine. And that's just a simple, layering up. And I think these pins might actually bend a little bit. There we go. Get them in place good enough so that you can take this to the machine and do a basting stitch at about an eighth of an inch all the way around the edge. Uh, I would advise doing that because it's going to be really hard to hold the layers together while you're putting that outer binding around the project. So 
this one is basted in place. So you can see there is a black stitching line all around that outside edge. Doesn't have to be perfect, just layer it together. Now, if you find that when you're doing your basting stitches that your machine is wanting to skip stitches and you're like, why is that happening? It's happening because the needle may be too small of um, a size for the project to work on. We're going through a lot of layers here, ladies and gentlemen. And sometimes the, the thread will drag on the fabric as it comes up through the fibers and cause a skipped stitch. So find, go to your drawer, figure out what size needle you had in there and move up a size or two possibly. And people say, well, won't that make a big hole? The idea is it needs to be a bigger hole because the needle actually isn't solid metal. It's actually cupped. On the front portion of your needle, if you put your fingernail along there, you'll find a little groove. And that groove allows the thread to float in that section so that it's protected as it goes down through the fibers and back up to make a stitch. And if that needle's too small and the thread's riding out here, it gets a lot of drag on the thread and it causes a skip stitch. So move up, even possibly to a size 16 needle. Everybody's machine is a little bit different. So between a 14 and a 16 may be the size needle you will need to protect the thread as it goes down through the fabric into that groove so it can make a proper stitch. So keep that in your back pocket when you have skip stitches and you're working on heavy multiple layer fabrics and fibers, move up one to two needle sizes in order to get protection for your thread to make a perfect stitch, okay? And you can usually see that starting to happen on the basting portion here so that you can switch it out before you get to working on your binding portion. Just a little side note, because it was, it would happen to me every once in a while when I'm working on something heavy and I'm thinking, I wonder if other quilters know that. Do they know to move up a size? So that's that's your uh, extra tip for the day for watching here at our events. Okay, then you've got your next piece of binding that's going to go around the outer edge. And it's just like putting the binding on that curved edge. We don't, you don't have any inside curves this time. We have all outside curves. So I usually, okay, my binding is all prepared and I have it linked. There's a, a seam in here. It's really hard to see the seams because sometimes people, well, I want one continuous piece. Well, there's a seam here and uh, there's another seam in here somewhere. I had to look for it earlier and I couldn't. Here. <laughs> there's a seam here and this is where it connected at the end. But this seam is perfectly smooth. It does not, um, it's not really um, something that's visible. So it's not a problem to link pieces together especially with a fabric that is so busy, you're never going to see that seam later. I tend to prepare the beginning portion of my binding by folding quarter inch. And this is cut at a 45 degree angle. And I am going to do a quick press on that. It kind of lost its press waiting for video. Okay. And then give it back a quick press. This is the way I um, learned from another great quilter on, um, on a show. Um, she is a well-known quilter and she prepared her piece this way, kind of making um, kind of a garage for the, when the other end comes around that you slide this end inside to finish off and you don't have to, you do, We'll want to go back maybe and stitch by hand to close the, the um, diagonal seam there. It's not stitched by machine, but I found that state fair quilt judges don't know the difference. And so if you can do a good hidden stitch, this is a technique that's really nice to use by um, starting at this end that has its edge prepared, a quarter inch seam has been turned back, put your binding on, come back around to the other end and tuck this inside to finish off your binding. You don't have to do that. Flip the two pieces, trying to figure out where your diagonal is. You can stitch it by hand. So here we go. Let's, let's do some uh, application of this binding to our chicken mitten to finish it off. 
Okay. Remember, we're using a quarter inch seam allowance. Okay. I'm going to start. And I'm opening it up and just securing that um, beginning portion with just one layer. The beginning. Cut thread. Take it out. This is a tip that a viewer sent to a show I was working on at the time. And at first I was like, what's he talking about? So I've just secured the underneath layer right here with a quarter inch seam allowance. Now I'm going to flip this back and I'm going to start down just a little bit and leave this garage door open so that I can tuck my tail uh, in when I get to the other end. So I'm going back down here. Doing just that little bit of prep work really does make the finishing because there are tools for binding. There are techniques out there. A zillion different um, quilters have come up with. This is the best technique. This is the best technique. But you know, when you have to go back and review the technique all the time, for me, that's not efficient. I wanted something I could remember how to do without instructions, without having to go watch a YouTube video. And it would be accurate every time. And this works really slick. Now, remember, I'm putting that excess fabric into my curve. That's why I'm working slow around the edge here. We'll just go maybe part way around. Oops. I would love to race around this and be finished really quick, but it would not look very good when I got finished then. So let's get at least part way. Here we go. Now, the, the binding is almost like standing straight up at this point so that it will have enough flex to move to the back side so if when you're doing your binding it looks like you're putting a ruffle on your chicken mitten you've done it right <laughs> isn't that it's a nice nice to know that when it looks wrong it's right for once okay and then when you get around to the finish on this portion where we've made that little garage door you're going to just tuck your piece as you're stitching around. You're going to tuck it in there. You can trim at an angle if you'd like. You're going to tuck it in and finish off that section so that it will be ready for you to turn to the back side. Now, let's do a little turn on this because with that binding standing straight up like that, it just looks like there's no way that's going to work, correct? Okay, I'm going to use just the nose of my iron. To open up that seam all the way where I stitched it on it. And then we're going to roll it to the back side. I love how this turns out. It's, there's something satisfying when things just go well. And when you turn that to the back side and it just pops right into place like that, it's just so nice and satisfying that you had that curve. And it's kind of coming to the back. I might use a little bit of that glue stick in order to put it just under that lip of the binding there to help hold it in place or the wonder clips, either one will work and then go back from the front and stitch in the ditch or you can stitch by hand on the back side to finish off your chicken mitten. This one I stitched by machine. It's not perfect, but by heavens, I think it will make it. So that's the back side after I stitched in the ditch on the front so that you can finish off that chicken mitten just in time for some spring baking. So if we don't have any other questions, oh, let's see, we have Karen saying, she ha says, great tips, I love it. Because you know, that's what, that's what quilters are all about, sharing ideas and things that work. Jan says it's her favorite way to do binding. Yes. <laughs> and we have Dorothy saying good morning from Indian Lake, Ohio. Oh, that's where the tornadoes went through. Our hearts are out sent and prayers are with you as you guys rebuild because tornadoes are not fun. I grew up in Iowa. I have seen the destruction of tornadoes more than once. Um, I grew up in what kind of north central Iowa where Tornado Alley was a really big thing and uh, spent many a time in the basement wondering if our house was going to be standing when we got out. So I understand. Um, also kind of from the generation of there's a tornado warning. Well, let's go stand in the driveway and watch the clouds for a while. And then 
let's get some shoes and go to the basement with a flashlight and a phone that's well charged. So I totally understand that. Um, let's see. Judy says, I use the same binding method on necklines. That's exactly the kind of edge trimming you would need because on a neckline, you need a nice smooth curve. And this is how you would do it. Perfect. Uh, Jesse says, that's a great tip with the binding. Um, it'll save me the many resos I have to do when I've gotten um, the join right. Yes. You know, getting that join together and smooth, it works. It's a little harder maybe on a curve, I will admit, but it does work. And it works great on straight of grain binding on your quilts, that little tuck method. And Alex Anderson, hats off to you, lady. You, I saw your, you teach that technique years ago. I adopted it as my own. I have taught quilters. I don't even know how many quilters over the years how to do that little tuck method. And it works every time. Don't need a tool. Don't need a reference. Maybe because I make so many quilts. But most people come back and say, love that technique. So. Chicken mitten, maybe it's on your afternoon to-do list. Thanks for joining me today. <laughs>